A major corporation is what some call little Tommy Whitmore, who is being held on drug charges. At 23, his holdings include two mansions and a stable of at least 14 vehicles and racing cars. Drugs and money, a corrupting influence. ...to an amazing life. And um, and Tommy is living life after death. How you doing today, Tommy? I'm all right yourself, brother. Um, so um, how was your day so far? Uh, so far, so good. You know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. Well, you know, <clears throat> I'm out of South Central Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, like most of us around mm -hmm. here. Um. I grew up in an impoverished neighborhood. Uh, mm -hmm. A Trey, Sevenfold, Hoover neighborhood. Most mm -hmm. of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, although I never, I never gang bang. Um. Um, I grew up over there, you know, watching pimps, players, hustlers, dope dealers, gangsters, thieves, murders, and robbers, just like all the rest of us. Yeah, the points of reference, you know, especially for um, the danger in that lifestyle. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I uh, <clears throat> as a youngster, um, you know, I had a, uh, a, a burning desire to want to have some, you know, have some money in my pocket and, and try to change the conditions up under which I was living. You know, I grew up in a single parent family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my mom was struggling mm -hmm. and um, she was going through her her, her trials and tribulations mm -hmm. and my pop was away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she told me at a young life that, I, you know, I was the man of the house. Mm. So I took that to heart. I took that to I, heart. I relate to that for you. Uh, my passion was uh, ride mini bikes and go karts. Oh, the, the, the kind with the lawnmower engine yes, right sir. there? Yes, okay, sir. so tell us about that, man. Yeah, you know, I, I did a lot of that. Um, I got you know. First, I started out with uh, bicycles. Mm -hmm. Went from bicycles to mini bikes and. But you had a Huffy. I had a Huffy. Yeah, I had a I had a I had a Huffy from mm -hmm. Pet Boy. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you know uh, I I I got another uh, bike and started putting it together. Put me a, a, a Swin Orange Crate together. Okay. My uncle helped me with that. Made a red line. No, it was just a regular Swin Orange Crate. Mm -hmm. And uh, put, we put that together, and it came out pretty nice. And mm -hmm. then it turned into a show bike, and then from there, so ended up getting stolen. Mm. And after that, I went on mini bikes and okay. mini bikes and go karts. After that, but okay. you know that cost a little bit of money, so I had to, I had to hustle. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. What about them? I, I did it on the regular little old, uh, before the beach cruisers came out. Mm -hmm. You know they had the regular little old, uh, the Huffy bikes. That yeah, you were Huffies, about. Yeah. yeah, star did, rims yeah. and stuff like yes, that. Sir. Half a pool. After that. Um, after my mom told me, you know, I was a man of the family, so I started to look at things a little bit different. What year was this, do you, do you it remember? It was like in the, um, maybe when I was around 9 or 10. Mm. So this had to be around uh, uh, 73, 74. Mm. So at that point, um, you know, I started to take on little jobs in the neighborhood, cutting grass, washing cars. Um, young op young uh, entrepreneur. Yeah. Yes, sir. Taking, yeah. You know, taking advantage of. Any way I could see to make some, you know, to make some, make some money. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a gambling shack up the street, and I used to see the, uh, you know, all the players go over there, and I see all these nice cars and you know everything go over there. So I wanted to know what what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I go down there and um, uh, look around, you know, to see what you know what was on. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I seen that, and I went over there and just start hanging around the older guys, you know, mm -hmm. and they run me off, and I come back. And um, you so, were attracted to him. Yeah, I was attracted to him, so I just kept mm. coming back. So they started send me, sending me on little errands. Mm. You know, run up to the store, man, get us something from the store. And they give me a few dollars for that. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon I was washing their cars. You know, I was doing little things like that to make a little money. And then, um, you know, I was able to, you know, make a little change where I could buy some cereal and milk. So me and my sister. About 10. About 10, yeah. Mm. I was about 10 years old. And so um, uh, uh, from that point, you know, I saw that, okay, you know, it's a way to. It's a way to you know to get things that you want out of life, but you you know you gotta get out you gotta get out there and get active. You gotta hustle. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. You know I I just kept hustling, and a lot of times when I couldn't you know make money doing that, I would get up early in the morning before the rest of my friends, and I would go hit all the trash cans in the neighborhood. Paper route, you had a paper route. No, too? I didn't have a paper route. Mm -hmm. What I would do is I would go get the Seven Up, Coke, Pepsi, you know all the bottles. The bottles. The big bottles. Mother Pride bottles. Crush. Crush all of them mm -hmm. and take them to the store. You know, cash them in and get some cereal milk so me and my sister could have something to eat in the morning. Mm. You know, I did those types of things until uh, I found a little job. It was a gardener a street over, and um, he needed, you know, some help in the summertime. So uh, I asked him, would he hire me? He said, yeah. So in the summertime, I would work for him. Summer youth programs? Not just a summer uh -huh. youth program, but just, a, you know, he was just, he was just an independent dude. He mm -hmm. was out of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and he needed some help. So I went and helped him. You know, he would pay me. And in the summer, I would work, save all my money, and I told my mother, you ain't got to buy me school clothes no more. Just spend all that on my sister. You know, I got me. You know what I'm saying? So that helped her to be able to get my sister 
the things that she needed for school, and I fend for myself. So, yeah. I well, after that, um, you know, I worked in the summertime, and then my uncle, one of my uncles, he had a, uh, he opened up a lawnmower shop. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I worked for him over at the lawnmower shop in the summer and then after school mm-hmm. in the wintertime. So I was able to make me a nice little amount of money doing that. Mm-hmm. And then by that time, my mom had, uh, you know, she had uh, started back working. And um, she was saving all her money up. She was working like uh, like double shifts every day mm-hmm. you know, for Mr. Jim's Barbecue. Mm. And um, so she was, you know, she was really working hard. I was working. Uh, so we ha- had something to contribute, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And I was always looking after my sister making sure, you know, she had what she needed. And then from that point, um, another one of my uncles had a liquor store right mm-hmm. there on uh, Century and Hobart mm-hmm. on the way to the racetrack, you know, mm-hmm. when you go into the horse racetrack. Mm-hmm. So I got a job working there, too. I was working two jobs. and then How I, old was you working so two I was jobs? Working, I was think I was like uh, maybe 13, 14, mm-hmm. around up in that area. Okay. Puberty. So I, yeah, I was working I was working two jobs, so I was able to buy my own clothes, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, like like before, um, and fend for myself and get mm-hmm. the things that I, you know, that I wanted. And then still be able to contribute to the household, you dig? Mm-hmm. So um, that went on for uh, for several years. And then around uh, 70, 1979, when everybody started gangbanging, when all the homies started gangbanging, mm-hmm. uh, I think I was like 14 years old. And um, I, it was a 65 Chevy on the corner of our street. I used to pass by it every day, and I liked the car, mm-hmm. but it didn't have a motor and transmission in it, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, one day I went up and asked them, you know, would they sell it to me? And to make a long story short, I ended up buying a car for $50. My mother had a car that was uh, hit in the back, mm-hmm. uh, a 70 Chevy. So I ended up buying the 65. Uh, she ended up giving me the motor transmission out of her 70 because she was going to junk it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I put it in 65, and that's where I got my first car at 14. Uh, so okay. when all the homies started mm-hmm. with the, with you know, they was banging, mm-hmm. I was over here trying to hustle to get get my car together because I wanted to be a lowrider. Yes, sir. You dig? Yes, so sir. That's, that started me on the path to lowriding. Yeah, it's funny because um, one of the big homies sold me a 19. 19- Time, um, you know, I started, I started trying to, you know, I was hustling trying to put my car together. And um, I ended up uh, getting it together. And shortly after that, uh, one of the guys out of 107, mm-hmm. when I was at the lawnmower shop working, I had a car parked in the front of Vermont. Mm-hmm. So one of the guys from 107 came by and asked me if I wanted to sell the car. And I'm like, yeah, I'll sell it. Because I, I wasn't really trying to sell it. But I said, yeah, I'll sell it for $800, just throwing something out there, mm-hmm. thinking that they was going to keep it pushing. Well, he went and got his dad and came back, and they gave me $800 for the car. Then you pay how much for the car? I pay fifty dollars for the car. And how much money you put into the car to fix it? Uh, probably another hundred and fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so I made me yeah. a nice little chunk of change. That was my first. That was my first time having that much money in my life. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I well. went and bought another another Chevy a '66. I think I paid a couple hundred dollars for it and started working on that. But around that time, um, uh, let's see, I did that for a couple of years. To work those jobs like that, and then when I got to the 12th grade, right after I graduated from the 12th grade mm-hmm. in like 1982, I had had a son in '81. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in '82, um, I, I was still working those jobs in '82. I graduated, and a cousin, uh, uh, one of my cousins, a female, she mm-hmm. um, she knew I was working hard, she knew I was struggling. I had a new kid, I was trying to, you know, feed my kid, mm-hmm. contribute to my, you know, to the family. You're 18 years old. The whole thing. Right. Too, bro. That's it. Yeah. And that's it. Once you get once you get bit by that bug right there, it ain't no turning back. Got more money than mama got. Yeah. So, you know, at that point when she when she put mm-hmm. me on that, um, mm-hmm. I cooked them up for her. And I told her, I said, I could sell, I could sell these this stuff right here. Because mm-hmm. I knew a lot of people in the in the neighborhood that was that was using it. She mm-hmm. said, you, you can't sell none. I said, yeah, I can. Mm-hmm. She said, okay, I'm gonna give you a, a gram and you you call me when you finish with it. Mm-hmm. So I, she told me how to cut it up. I cut it up. I took mm-hmm. the gram, cut it in four pieces. Mm-hmm. Like she said, I, each piece is fifty dollars, so that's two hundred dollars. You keep a hundred and give me a hundred. I'm like, all right. Mm-hmm. She, two hours later, I called her back and said, I got your money. So mm-hmm. from that point, she gave me what is called an A track. Mm-hmm. Back A-track, then, it was yeah. like uh, three and a half grams. Mm-hmm. Three and a half gram on one shot. Yeah. yeah. So she gave me the three and a half yeah. grams. It took me like a, like two days. I sold that, mm-hmm. and she couldn't believe it. So after a couple of weeks, she couldn't keep up with, with with my little thing. So I had to start searching for alternative ways to, to uh, you know, to uh, be able to serve my customers. So what I'm hearing is the same story, is. The liquor store put on hold. 
um, the lawnmower shop. shop put on hold. But I was still, but see, the thing mm -hmm. was, I was still juggling these jobs, right? Because mm -hmm. I didn't want my mom to know that I was that yeah. I was doing this. So I would stand out, and mm -hmm. because he right next to order my house was an alley. Mm -hmm. So when I get off work, you know what I'm saying? All everybody knew. This is where I'm gonna be at. I'm gonna be in the alley. Mm -hmm. So I hang out in the alley, and I, you know, I do my thing there, mm -hmm. or I'd have them come up to the liquor store and pick them up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I did my thing right there. So uh, it got to a point though where uh, they started coming to the front door, mm. and my mom asked me. She said, uh, "What's going on? Why are all these people coming over here?" So you know, I told her. I said, "You know, I, you know, I just went ahead and told her. I kept it real with her." Mm -hmm. And she said, "Okay, well, look, you can't do that here because the police will come kick the door in and take the house from us, and you know how our, you know, I work to, to do this right here. So uh, we got to find you a place." Mm -hmm. So she ended up finding me a, a place over here on uh, 83rd between Hoover and mm -hmm. Vermont. Mm -hmm. Right, and some duplexes that go through from 83rd to 82nd. Yeah. yeah, about $400 a month if they was that. Yeah, yeah, about, yeah. about so that. That was my first, uh, my mm -hmm. first place. I think I was like 17 still then. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I went over there, moved in there, uh, uh, and lived there for two years in a crack yeah. house. Yeah. In a crack house, but it was, uh, it, it changed my life though, because what happened was after, uh, after uh, my cousin couldn't keep up, you know with the supply that yeah. I needed, that's that's when around the time Rick started to uh, get himself together mm -hmm. and, and get on. So he was my supplier for a minute. Mm -hmm. Rick was my first guest on Life After Death. Yes, sir. You know, and, um, you know, we told, told we, so much similarities and the time that we did and all that stuff. And um, I told him, I said, I got to get Tommy on the show. He's like, you better get Tommy on the show. Yeah. So... So you know, at, as as um as as I moved over there, um eventually that's I was making like a hundred thousand dollars a day, damn near out of that place over there. Mm -hmm. So I lived in that spot for two years. Mm -hmm. That's all I did. See, I was taking hefty bags of money out mm -hmm. of that place every single day. So the change, the change, the change happened. It's it's embedded in you now. Um, this is this is what we're doing. We getting it. We getting it. I'm I'm getting it. I'm getting it. And it just changed the whole dy of the thinking, the values, the belief yes, system, um, um, the associates, uh, the community. Everything changed. Yes. Because them bags of money. Yes, sir. And um, I totally, totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, uh, um, um, like I said, staying there for like two years before the cops came and kicked the door. Mm -hmm. And then when they finally did they really didn't even know what rocks were. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody just told them cocaine was being sold out yeah, of there. Yeah, they thinking powder. Yeah, so, but when I came up out of there, I had almost $7 million in cash. Mm -hmm. But I stayed there for two years. Years, yeah. 24-7. Mm -hmm. Only time I left was to go get drugs and come back. Mm -hmm. That was it. That's it. You know, the kids, you know, make sure they're taken care of. But the but thing was this. See, this is, this, is this. It, 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 it propelled me to another level because... Um, I kept searching for suppliers. I couldn't find people that could keep up. Mm -hmm. So eventually I found, I got in touch with, a, uh, I found a Mexican guy. Mm -hmm. um, and he um, was supplying me, but he wanted me to sell kilo quantities. I wasn't into the kilo quantity mm -hmm. thing at that time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I would come and get like, you know, I would come and get four or five keys from him every week. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I pay for him and he'd give them to me and I'd go and I'd cook them up and be fast mm -hmm. as I can get it cooked up. It was gone. Mm -hmm. So what did I started doing after that was um, um, it just it, it was just so it was so much so fast. <clears throat> Seventeen, eighteen years old, you don't know what to do with that kind of money. A lot of these. So so, mm -hmm. the money the money was just it it was it was so fast that I didn't I didn't have time to develop socially, mm -hmm. to be able to manage the type of revenue that was coming in. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was just taking the money and putting it up. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And um, I didn't even get a chance to really spend none mm -hmm. at first. Just stack it up. Yeah, it was it was, just, it was coming in so fast. So mm -hmm. um, when, the, when the cops finally did come and they closed the place down, by this time, um, you know, I had, a, I had a, a steady connection with the Mexican guy. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so I had to transition now from being you know in a rock house mm -hmm. to going out amongst our peers exactly let's let's hold that thought right there now let's talk about time has passed now 
You got the property, the prestige, got all that right now. And got, you know, the, the power, the property, and the prestige. Now, what does Los Angeles look like now oh, at this time? It's, it's transitioning. Let's talk about that for a brief moment. It's transitioning. Now mm -hmm. we're seeing, um, you know, the brothers that were, just, that were just banging and doing that. Mm -hmm. Now you got the brothers that's gang banging and they selling dope together. Mm -hmm. So now they got money. So now it's an influx of guns coming in. Mm -hmm. So now the whole dynamic of the gang thing changes too. Mm -hmm. You see, because before, whereas before it, it wasn't a lot of guns like it was uh, prior to like 1984, mm -hmm. 83, 84. Mm -hmm. Around that time, that's when the influx of guns started coming into the community and, it, and the violence increased. Mm -hmm. You know, 80s was very, very dangerous, especially in the beginning of the, of, yes, of the rock ec ec um, epidemic. Yes, sir. So now it's now life is changing. You, you got this money, you know, you got this, pr this power, this prestige. Kids are taking care of, moms are straight, everything is going. But deep down, deep down. Well, deep down, um, you know, the values that... Uh, my mother and my grandmother instilled in me, mm -hmm. uh, um, and 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 the other people in my life, my aunts, my uncles, you know, mm -hmm. the other people that and my pops, the other people that contributed to raising me, mm -hmm. those values got lost. Mm -hmm. They got submerged by and overcome by um, this new lifestyle that I, that that I was taking on, mm -hmm. and things were changing so fast. Mm -hmm. So when I came up out of the crack house, the first thing I I did. Now, because I didn't know what to do with all this time that I had, mm -hmm. so I started. I started mm -hmm. buying shit. Mm -hmm. I was 19 years old when I, I bought my first Rolls Royce at 19. Mm -hmm. I went down to Gigi's to on Six and Hill mm -hmm. and bought the biggest medallion that 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 he that he made. Yeah, tell them the story about the Ferrari. They're gonna laugh about that. Oh, one. tell them tell them that story. Uh, tell them that story about the Ferrari. I bought a. Uh, when the Ferrari Testarossa first came out. Mm -hmm. And what year was this, Tommy? It was 1980, into 84, and how, 85. And how old was you, Tommy? I was 19, 20 years old. Was you a rapper back then, Tommy? No, sir. All right, so you bought 1989, you're not a rapper. 19, 1985. 1985, you're not a rapper, 19 years old. You already got a Rolls Royce already. And now he's getting ready to buy the first year Ferrari, the Ferrari Testarossa. What happened that day, bro? Okay, well, let's, let's blow they let's, let's blow their minds. Let's let's backtrack a little bit. Before mm. I got the Ferrari Testarossa, I bought a convertible Ferrari called a Mondial. Mm. A what? A Mondial. Ah, oh, pronounce that, damn Mon it. <laughs> Mondial. That was I bought a convertible. Yeah. You know, so I had that for about six months. Mm -hmm. But then they came out with the Testarossa, which was a V12. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a straight 12. So I said, well, no, I got to have that. Mm. I got to be able to be the fastest on the uh, <laughs> on the block. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody else had one. Mm -hmm. Nobody else had a Mondial either, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I got the Tessarosa, uh, that just killed the whole game. Mm -hmm. I came through, I pulled up to the car wash, everybody mm -hmm. surrounded the car like I was a president. It's the property, that's that prestige right there. Yeah, I had it for about a week, mm -hmm. and I was on the uh, 91 freeway mm -hmm. going eastbound, uh, racing with a friend of mine. I, I bought him a, a 930 uh, poor slant nose. Mm -hmm. uh, we were racing, and uh, uh, somebody, I was behind him, and I was trying to come around so I can pass him. Mm -hmm. But the guy in front of him slammed on brakes for some reason. Mm -hmm. Well, his car went up, un because it was slope nose, mm -hmm. it went up under the guy's car, flipped it over. And I turned, you know, trying to get away from the accident. Mm -hmm. But a Ferrari Testarossa is wide as the entire lane, mm -hmm. the back of it is. Mm -hmm. So when I swerved towards the center divider, my quarter panel hit the center divider, and the car spun out, and I hit seven cars and totaled out the car. And what happened after that, Tommy? I went back next week and bought another one. <laughs> How much some cars cost, Tommy? Like $135,000. So uh, $135,000 times two. Yeah, plus seven cars I had to buy for the people that I crashed out. Hmm. 19 years old. 19, just finna get, finna getting ready to turn 20. Ain't that something? Football players don't even get that. But this is part of that lifestyle. This is the pretty side of the game now. Yeah. The pretty side of the game. We got the property. We got the prestige. We got the power. We got the popularity. Um, but going down the line, the long-term goal, the long-term vision. Yeah, you see I what I'm saying? I didn't have that. You see, now, now this is the part that we don't want to glorify on life after death. This is just part of that lifestyle that we're talking about. It's, it's just, This is part of the game that... 
you got a chance to um, experience and you know people in that lifestyle we got a chance to experience it on different levels you see what I'm saying but the outcome is always the same, same yeah. jails and institutions crash and, and burn Maybe and crash and burn so go ahead brother okay so after um after I, I bought the second Ferrari I went right after that and bought a brand new Another brand new Rolls Royce hardtop and convertible, mm -hmm. <clears throat> both red, mm -hmm. tan interior, red piping. Put the wheels on them, the sound systems in them. Mm -hmm. I went and built me a house in Orange County. I paid like a, a million two hundred thousand dollars to build the house. Mm -hmm. uh, I went and rented me a, a, a penthouse suite on a Wilshire Boulevard mm -hmm. in the LSA building. I had the, the entire top floor, ten thousand square feet. I had like a, maybe a twenty spots around the city. Mm -hmm. That you know, I was I was working out of, and mm -hmm. uh, by this time though, see, I had started to sell it. I started selling kilos. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Mexican connect that I had, mm -hmm. um, you know, I knew I knew everybody in the, in the, in the, in the town. Yes, sir. You know, I didn't gang bang, so I was able mm -hmm. to go in everybody's neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to be in a blood neighborhood, be in a crib neighborhood, be on the east side, the west side, wherever I wanted to be at, because everybody knew. That I was I was in, involved in gang in mm -hmm. the gang thing, mm -hmm. so everybody got along with me. So I would be in Watts, I would be in Compton, I would be everywhere. So all of the homies that now had transitioned from selling rocks to mm -hmm. kilos, mm -hmm. now they had an outlet. Besides Ricky, they had an outlet with myself, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, my connect ended up uh, uh, introducing me to a female. Mm -hmm. Uh, a chick out of Colombia, mm -hmm. and um, she really uh, uh, started uh, dumping a lot of cocaine in my lap, and that really, really, I really took off after that. You know, mm -hmm. she started out with uh, uh, 25 kilos the first time. Mm -hmm. After that, it was 75. After that, it was 200. Mm -hmm. And every time after that, it was 500. Mm -hmm. So I would get 500 kilos, um, and um, I was making five to eight thousand dollars profit per kilo mm -hmm. and it would take me approximately a week a week and a half to sell the 500 so mm -hmm. do the math on that that's millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars yeah so i had you know. crazy i had crazy money coming in and you know i see a lot of these dudes on these videos with their little money machines and uh, you know they they doing that's this all they see real players know that mm -hmm. see what i had was a, a an old horse mm -hmm. electric scale mm -hmm. and i would put a big uh, 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 plastic sheet over it, zero it out, and mm -hmm. I would weigh the money. Mm -hmm. Because trying to count five or six million dollars in, in, in small bills it ain't take happen. you days. Mm -hmm. Just right? weigh it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. when I found out that all bills weighed a gram, mm -hmm. it was a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Just weigh the money. That's it. So yeah. we would weigh the money, um, wrap it up, and send it off. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how we would do it. Um, and you would have runners to take money, the smaller bills, to banks mm -hmm. and change out the smaller bills to bigger bills and, you know, yeah. put them up like that. But um, it, it, it would just, everything happened so fast. And it, it really overwhelmed me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I had made a lifestyle for myself where I was spending like $110,000 a month in bills. Yeah. Yeah. So if I quit the drug business, like most people say, well, why didn't you quit? You had all this, you know, but I was spending so much money. I was taking care of everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, it would just, it would just, it just, it was overwhelming. And mm -hmm. I, and I was young. I didn't know what to do. And I didn't, you know, a lot of people gave me good advice. I'm not going to say that people that wasn't around me that advised me mm -hmm. good, but there was nobody around that I respected enough to take the advice from. So, so what well, the thing is, you know, when you start, when you get to that level and you start making that kind of money, mm -hmm. people start to view you different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you can go hang out in the neighborhood no more, mm -hmm. you know, for extended periods of time, unless you got a lot of goons with you. Mm -hmm. And then you got to keep them guns with you. You got you got to mm -hmm. do that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, you know, I've, I've been in those type of situations where, you know, um, it's, 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 it, it, it was bad. It turned out bad. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So that's the flip side of the game, though. Mm -hmm. See, everybody talks about... You know what I'm saying? All the good stuff that comes with it. But the, what about the, the robberies and the, the ugly side, the and, ugly and, side. And, and all these other different things? Yeah. You see, because that's going to come with the game. Cuts that's, and scrapes. That's where all this That's all this happened, being yeah. tied up. Because, um, Cuts and scrapes yeah. come with the game, though. Mm -hmm. You got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. You know, so 
you you talked about earlier about having a vision of the future and mm-hmm. what that would look like. Well, I never thought that I would live over 21, 22 years old, mm-hmm. coming from where we came from. Yeah. So I was trying to do the most in the time that I thought I would live. Mm-hmm. I never was able to look past 21 or 22 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, so when people were giving me this good advice, um, it was going in one ear and coming out the other. Mm-hmm. You know, they planted the seed, but it just didn't germinate at the time they gave it to me. Mm-hmm. You see, so as time progressed, though, I was like I was telling you earlier, I had I had I had got to a point where I had become despised. I had I had, I had started to despise the game mm-hmm. and the things that come with it, and the person that it had made me into, that had made me become something. That um, uh, that I didn't even recognize. It's not what, what a lot of people don't understand is when you when you make these lifestyles, when you get into a position where you are spending an, an exorbitant amount of money every month mm-hmm. to sustain your lifestyle, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you become a slave to that. Mm. Because because see this lifestyle now is your persona. It's, it's who you are. Little it's time who, ghost. Yeah, it's who, junior. It, yeah, it's yeah. who people yeah. expect you to be. Wow. So now that you've made this lifestyle for yourself, you can't. It's not easy to just change that and just give it all up. Mm-hmm. You know because you still want to be ghosts. Yes. I still wanted to be young Tom, a little mm-hmm. Tommy. Mm-hmm. You see, by the way, Freeway Rick gave me that name. I know. Yeah, you talked about that. Yeah, weeks, he's the first weeks, so. one to start calling me mm-hmm. Young Tommy. Yeah. Yeah, now I hear all these rappers out here now, young this, little that, and young this. Where the hell that come from? 19, years, 19 year old guys jumping out of Rolls Royces mm-hmm. with medallions just big and big gold and, nah. and diamond rings on with no shirt on. Now, them dudes with record deals right now. Yeah. Them's the only dudes with record deals right now. Yeah. They're jumping Back out then, of the at 19 years old, Not I was that. up in Caesars Palace mm-hmm. for all the major fights, sitting mm-hmm. on the front row mm-hmm. with the big mean coats on mm-hmm. and my crew with me. Yeah. You know, all that, all that stuff. But see, it's a price to pay for that. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah, you know, the people um, people always say, they talk about, uh, you know, those of us who come out these urban cities and these mm-hmm. urban areas, you know, like we animals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because we're trying to change the reality of our condition. Mm-hmm. You know, they say that, you know, we're sick people because we sold dope and we, we robbed or we did whatever we mm-hmm. did. But what's sick is, mm-hmm. is, is uh, living in a rat-infested ghetto and not trying to do nothing to change the reality of that condition. Mm-hmm. You know, we looked at, I looked at, just like the rest of these guys look at the opportunity that we had as a way to escape. Most of us looked at it. Yeah. Not everybody, but a lot of us. Yeah, and so, you know, with that being said, <clears throat> fast forward into uh, August 17, 1990. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had 110 cops descend on myself and the rest of my co-defendants. Mm-hmm. I had like 32 places in uh, in L.A. In, in in Los Angeles County that they raided. Uh, they looked for drugs and guns and money, and mm-hmm. they didn't really find any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, they found a you know a couple of registered guns that co-defendants had, but yeah. you know they didn't find any drugs or any money. Mm-hmm. And then from that point on, <clears throat> that really that really changed everything. Mm. You know, um, <clears throat> like I was telling you before, I had become, I had got to a point where I was just, I, I grew to despise the game mm-hmm. um, and what it represented. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was able to, my eyes were coming open a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, I was listening to uh, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, uh, the um, uh, video. Back then it was VHS, was it? VHS. And the Minister Far kind of, my eyes had be started started to come open a little bit. That's when he came to the L.A. Coliseum, I believe. Yeah, I it think. was just, a, I, had, mm-hmm. I had got like a lot of videotapes of him, and I would listen to his videotapes mm-hmm. and watch. So my eyes started to become open, and I wanted to change, but I didn't know what to do to make the change, to mm-hmm. make the transition. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to give up the game and do something else and, you know, and go a different direction, but I just didn't know what to do. As I was telling you, you know, Minister Farrakhan mm-hmm. introduced a totally new idea mm-hmm. to me. <clears throat> and when he did that, you know, <clears throat> I started to try to to try to transition, mm-hmm. but I didn't trust anybody enough to 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 help me in that transition. Mm-hmm. Because I had loaned money to so many people. You know, people that I've grown up grown up with, you know, that my peers, their mothers and fathers losing their homes mm-hmm. here, forty, fifty thousand dollars. 
Mm-hmm. Pay your bills. You don't owe me nothing. Mm-hmm. Or you pay me back later. And I never get never mm-hmm. get a dime back. People losing their cars. People needed their... Whatever they needed. Mm-hmm. I, I was doing that. So I lost a lot of money like that. You know, trying to invest in different business ventures and stuff like mm-hmm. that. You know, with, with so-called family members and close friends. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they beat me. Mm-hmm. Okay, but what was I going to do? Go and, 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 and kill them? Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't... I, I, mm-hmm. I'm raised with your kid. Mm-hmm. What I'm doing, go kill his mother and father? Mm-hmm. You know, I can't yeah. do that. Yeah. So that being said, um, I didn't trust anybody enough to help me transition. There was nobody that I could go to to say, look, man, I want to stop this, and I want to invest this to help me get me, get me over here. Mm-hmm. There was nobody there for me to do that with. Mm-hmm. You know, the one person that I had that, 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 that could have helped me didn't want to get involved. So um, I didn't. I ended up uh, continuing on, mm-hmm. and then August seventeenth, nineteen ninety, it came to an ab- abrupt halt. But it was like you know, and, and I'm gonna say this now. It might it might sound strange to a lot of people, but it was like a relief. It was like mm-hmm. uh, a big weight lifted up off my shoulders. Now all of the responsibility that I had up to that point. Was, was, re- was removed. Was, was removed. removed. But but not completely mm-hmm. because while I was in MDC, mm-hmm. you know, preparing for trial, um, you know, I was still taking care of everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I was calling home every day, calling my mom every day, saying, "Look, make sure so and so got this. Make sure so and so got this. Uh, my kid's mother over here got this. My kid's mother over here got this." She said, "Look, mm-hmm. stop." Mm-hmm. She said, "What you need to do right now is worry about getting yourself." Out of there, uh-huh. she said. All of us out of here, we we gonna we gonna make it. We gonna take care of ourselves. Your kids ain't gonna starve. Uh-huh. They mamas ain't gonna let them starve. Yeah, everybody. You need uh-huh. to stop trying to take care of everybody and take care of yourself. So, um, in that period, um, you know, I lost myself in the beginning. Um, you know, when I first uh, uh, fell. Mm-hmm. Um, even before I went to trial, while I was preparing for trial, you know, they had like two, 200 audio tapes in my case. Uh-huh. And I was able to go down to the to the audio room and listen to myself on audio tapes uh-huh. uh, to prepare for trial. And in these audio tapes, while I was going through that process, uh-huh. um, I listened to myself and I didn't even recognize myself. This is how far uh-huh. off... I had, <clears throat> I had, I had fallen from who I truly am. Mm-hmm. You know, I was listening to these tapes and I was saying to myself, if the agents who investigated this case and put this case together, if somebody didn't know who I was prior to becoming who I was at that particular time, they said, this guy's an animal. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I didn't even believe it was hard for me to even stomach the way I talked to people, the way I behaved on, the, you know, on, on audio tapes. Mm-hmm. I made up in my mind at that particular time, right then, before trial even started, that my life was going to take a different course. Mm-hmm. I was going to get back to the values that were instilled in me by my mom. My grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, mm-hmm. and, and everybody else. Have you? They gave me 12 40-year sentences and a life sentence without the possibility of parole running concurrent. And then they gave me five years consecutive for a gun. And on top of that, a $2 million fine after they've taken $4 million of my property. So do the math on that. They took everything mm-hmm. that I had, that I that I worked for, mm-hmm. um, everything that they could find. They took. They took uh, the home I bought for my mother, mm-hmm. um, everything, apartment buildings, the home I built, everything that that I had. They took, mm-hmm. um, and left me with nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you no, know, because I never believed. I never believed that I would be in prison for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, the prosecutor told me, she said, you're going to die in prison. Mm-hmm. Not only did she tell me that, a mm-hmm. couple of the agents told me that as well. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't know about this thing called the higher power now. 
They said, you know, you 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 are, you are an animal and you're gonna die in prison. Yeah. Um. So you know they had thrown dirt on my chest. Mm -hmm. You know uh, who comes back from twelve forty year sentences? Mm -hmm. That part. Mm -hmm. You know I want to say this. You know you know. Um, a lot of a lot of guys got those sentences and they broke. Mm -hmm. um, they broke with thirty year sentences. They broke. Mm -hmm. They went through the district court system, and the federal district court system broke these guys' spirits. Um, and now they're 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 mm -hmm. fine with being in prison and being a prison orderly, mopping prison floors, mm -hmm. go out to the rec yard playing dominoes, checkers, and chess all day. Different ways than four plates. Yeah, and all of that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? All of that stuff yeah. that don't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, because their spirits have been broken, you know. And I don't blame the brothers for that, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because we we never should have had to undergo that kind of oppression. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was a it was a white guy that was an airplane pilot that got caught with three hundred kilos bringing up from Mexico to America and he was facing fifteen years. Mm-hmm. They didn't catch me with anything and gave me 12, 40 year sentences and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. It's this systemic racism. You know, so, uh, you know, I don't blame the brothers for, 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 you know, dealing with or coping with that time the way they coping with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I blame the system for doing that to us the way they did it mm -hmm. because it, did, it shouldn't have been that way. You know, and then later on, the, uh, the Congress, the Supreme Court, and the district courts came together and said these sentences were disproportionate. They are wrong. These guys never should have got this kind of time. Mm -hmm. But we would already did 25, 26, 27 years. The thing about that is mm -hmm. this right here, right? A lot of black people think Bill Clinton was, you know, the, 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 the second coming of Jesus. No, he was not. He was one of the worst presidents we ever had when it comes to... Uh, 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 the war on drugs. The, the war, war on drugs, drugs. And, 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 and given, given guys like myself who had these illegal sentences an opportunity mm -hmm. to get back into the court system mm -hmm. when the laws did change. Mm -hmm. You have guys sitting in prison right now today from the late 80s, early 90s with these life sentences that can't get back into court and take advantage of the new law changes that Obama brought in. The mm -hmm. I stayed in there. Mm. You know, the homies was like, man, you going to come out and hang out with us on the on the, on the, on the rec yard, you know, mm. come out and watch the game or whatever. So they giving out release dates out there? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I said, if y'all need me to be there, I'll be there. But mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I'm going to be in this law library. Mm -hmm. You know, I went through six U.S. attorneys mm -hmm. fighting my case. And it, it, it was a blessing, though, brother. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have did this on my own. Mm, I'm not. The United States attorneys are the best lawyers in the world. Mm -hmm. Not in America, but yeah. in the world. Yeah. And for me to beat them mm -hmm. and come out of and give back 1240s and a life without parole, for me to be able to do that, that's a blessing, brother. That's not, that's, okay, let's go back to 2004. Mm -hmm. from, from 1990 to 2004, I was spending money paying lawyers to fight my case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't get no results, just spending money. Mm -hmm. And so a guy out of Tennessee named Toriano, he told me, he said, look, man, you need to start fighting your own case. Nobody know your case better than you do. Mm -hmm. He said, these people got, they go home and screw their wives at night, mm -hmm. play with their children, mm -hmm. go out on the weekend camping trips. Mm -hmm. Your case is sitting up in their office. Say, but you got all this time right here, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 46 seconds of each and every day to work on your case and to try to get your liberation. Mm. He say, be dedicated to your case like you dedicated to this weight pile. Mm. Oh, he, he hit Speak me in the on. head with yeah. that. You need, yes, he yes, sir. He hit me in the head yes, with sir. that. And he didn't just stop right there. Mm -hmm. He kept on me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, got, I got mad at the brother for him being on me so hard. But mm -hmm. now I, I, I love that he did that. That's that point of reference you was always looking for. Yeah, because I, I went in there and I started working on my case and I kept getting told no mm -hmm. from 2004 to 2010 and I finally got a break. Mm, and what year you get that break? 2010, I got a break. Mm -hmm. But then when I when I did beat them in the court, mm -hmm. the court didn't want to write an opinion mm -hmm. because they didn't want okay. other other inmates. So mm -hmm. they let my stuff sit there for years. So I ended up having to go to the appellate court 
and ask them to force the district court to make a ruling on my motion mm -hmm. that the prosecutor conceded to. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, the, the appellate court denied my motion because they didn't want to write an opinion. Open the door. It, it, because it would have been set precedence. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they called the district court and told the district court the same day they denied my, my motion, they called the district court and told the district court, answer the man's motion. Mm -hmm. So when they answered the motion, I filed a notice of appeal and opened up my case all over again. Mm -hmm. That's how I ended up getting back in the court. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, because I knew that if I continued to go pro se, mm -hmm. that they would continue to string me along for years and years and years, and I would never get... The relief. I'll never get the relief I'm seeking, mm -hmm. right? So what I did was, because I'm back on direct appeal again, I have the rights to have a counsel, mm -hmm. right? So I requested a counsel. They appointed me a guy, but I already had all my stuff done. Mm -hmm. And when he came on my case, he argued with me for, for about two hours, mm. asking me, why are you trying to appeal something that you won? I said, the, the, the point is not to appeal the 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 uh the the motion that I won mm. the point is to get my entire case reopened. He said you can't do that. Yeah. I said well according to Magwood versus Patterson, mm. United States Supreme Court 2010, I can. Yeah. I said go read the case. I said according to U.S. versus Lef Leframbri, a 2005 case, U.S. versus Coven, a 2007 case out of the Ninth Circuit, I can. You become an attorney. You be, yeah, you know that law. So, so mm -hmm. when he when he 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 said, I said, go read those cases and I'll call you back. So mm -hmm. when I called him back, he still wouldn't concede. But he said this. He said, uh, uh, we'll we'll proceed forward. I said, okay, this is this is this is the thing though. Mm -hmm. I already have my brief ready. I'm gonna send it to you. You can put your fine lawyer language on it and put your title on it. Do whatever you got to do. Mm -hmm. But um. My issues need to stay the same. He said, okay, if I find any other issues, I'll put them with that. And he found one more issue, and he put it in there. Mm -hmm. But um, when we presented our, our stuff mm -hmm. to the to the appellant court, the appellant court immediately, immediately uh, told the prosecutor, this, this man is clear. This man is not trying to challenge his convictions. He's only trying to challenge his illegal sentences. Mm -hmm. Congress has said, the Supreme Court has said, and we have said, his sentences are illegal. Mm -hmm. Why are you opposing this? Mm -hmm. she, she was stuck. So shortly after that, uh, they reversed and remanded my case back to the district court for resentencing. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, left uh, Friday service, came back to the unit, got on the email, mm -hmm. checked my email. My lawyer emailed me and said, uh, good news. Reversed and remanded to the district court for a complete resentencing under the laws that exist today. Mm -hmm. I knew that was out that, the door. And that was that. That was that. So, I got down mm -hmm. on the floor, mm -hmm. right in the right in the uh, uh, TV room, mm -hmm. and I uh, put my forehead on the ground and thank God. And um, all the brothers was in there jumping up and down. They was in there, you know, gambling, mm -hmm. doing whatever. Mm -hmm. they yeah, were yeah, doing. yeah. The day room. Asked yeah. me, uh, what happened? I said, I just won my case. You gave Tommy a space. They as soon as mm -hmm. I as soon as I got up, they all mm -hmm. hugged me and you mm -hmm. know, man, I'm so glad you you know you you you, you did it, man, you did it. It paid off. Mm -hmm. All the time you spend in law library paid off. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all praise due to God. Um, things happen so fast. Um, you know, let me say this mm -hmm. just as a as a pretext of what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. In prison, um, when mm -hmm. you're about to get out of prison, <clears throat> they don't have mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre-release programs for lifers. You have to be within 18 months of of release release before you can enter a pre-release program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there was no pre-release program for guys like me who won their cases and went back to court. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't get time to prepare, mm -hmm. right? So my whole entire focus was on getting out of prison, not what I'm gonna do when I get out. Mm -hmm. My my all my energy and effort was spent on getting out. Mm -hmm. You know, I always said, okay, I can figure out what I'm going to do after I win this case, but right now I have to beat this case. Right? Mm -hmm. So, when that happened, I immediately went into the laser focus of what am I going to do when you get out, when of I jail. get out of jail. Yes, sir. Uh, one of my young partners, uh, he told me, he said, look, man, 
he said, um, I'm going to tell you about a business that's, that, you know, that's good for guys like us, you know, been mm -hmm. to prison or whatever. He said, man, get you, get in the trucking business, mm -hmm. you know, get you a dump truck and you can make you some pretty good money. You can make, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month, you know, that can, you know, help you to be able to raise enough capital to do other things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, oh, wow. I said, yes, you know, is that easy? He said, yeah, but you know, just get, get a truck, you know, so. I got out, um, and it was a struggle from day one. Um, it was hard for me to get a driver's license. It was hard for me to get an ID. It was, I mean, I had, because mm. I had been gone for so long that all my stuff was purged out the system. Yes, sir. Mine was, too. So it took me yeah. a week to get my stuff together just so I can get an ID and mm. then get a Social Security card and mm. then get a driver's license. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it, was, it was a struggle every step of the way, so I did that. Once I got my driver's license, I enrolled in trucking school. I did a 10-week program in trucking school, learned mm -hmm. how to drive diesel trucks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then after that, I went to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I started um, work for uh, L.A. Times, uh, driving for them. Mm -hmm. I drove uh, for a uh, true American trucking company, a dump truck company. Mm -hmm. I drove for DNW uh, trucking company. You know, a few trucking companies I drove for, and I just saved my money, kept saving my money, and I was trying to build my credit at the same time mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, do things the way. Differently. Yeah, do things. Differently. You know, just refocus the energy. Exactly, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. if, I could, if I could be successful in the, in the, in the dope game, mm -hmm. why can I be successful legitimately? Exactly. All I have to do is redirect the energy. That's it, yeah. You see? So I, I started attending seminars on how to build my credit, mm -hmm. on, how to, on how to conduct business. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to redirect this energy to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. So as I did that, I, you know, avenues started to open up. It took it took a while. It took me a couple of years, and then I finally, as I, I kept applying for loans, I kept getting getting denied. No, so I finally got a loan. Went and bought me a truck. Then borrowed some money from some of my mm -hmm. street partners and mm -hmm. put a box on the truck. Uh, got all my business stuff set up and everything, and then went to work. And that's a letter of atonement to uh, the community, mm -hmm. and they published it in the um, in the L.A. Sentinel. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, you know, basically apologizing to the community for the havoc that I raised in the mm -hmm. community. And I got a lot of feedback from the community, you know, people, firemen, police mm -hmm. officers, just common folk would just mm -hmm. write me back when mm -hmm. I was in prison, and they were saying, you know, we really like the transition that you've made, and um, you have an amazing story. And um, keep up the good work, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I even had some contacts, but the warden at the institution I was in Phoenix wouldn't mm -hmm. allow them to come there and interview me. But um, yeah, brother, I, you know, I I, I wanted to um, um, let a lot of these younger brothers know mm -hmm. that might be thinking about getting in the game or in the game or whatever. That you know, um, that the end that, that the end game to that is always going to turn out. It's always going to mm -hmm. be bad. Yeah. It's always going to mm -hmm. be bad. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, take that energy and redirect it. If you can possibly find somebody to help you redirect that energy to do something else, you could be just as successful doing something else as you can doing that. Mm. You know? But um, yeah, he got removed and convicted for sexual assault. Um, life is good, you know. If you need companies out there. What's the name of your business? TG and K Material Haulers One through Five. Say that slow so they can so they can hook that up T right there. TG and K Material Haulers One through Five. We um, move dirt, sand, gravel, uh, asphalt, concrete, whatever you need moved.